about my personal life, I think you have, many of you have read in the Global Mail this morning. So I won't talk very much about how I escaped and so forth. Uh, 60 years have passed since I was dug out of the debris and was rescued from fiery death. I was 13, grade 8 student, witnessed the dawn of nuclear age. It was hell on earth. As I look back, two outstanding um, memories. Although that attack took place in the morning at 8.15, by the time I crawled out of the collapsed building, it was dark, like in the evening. Perhaps because of all the smoke and dust and the particles in the air, which was sucked up into the mushroom cloud. Another thing I remember is the silence. You would expect in a situation like that, people get panic and scream and yell and run. But that was not what I saw. People were physically, psychologically traumatized. And uh, people just simply whispered, asking for water and water. When I came out of the collapsed building, the, since I was at the military headquarters, we were told by the soldier, you girls, a few of us who survived, you escaped to that hillside. You see the sunlight coming through that opening. Get moving, don't give up. You see, I couldn't move by your body, but this stranger in the coat of darkness tried to loosen the timber, which struck me. And, and as my eyes got used to the darkness, I started seeing the streams and streams of human beings, but I don't think we can call them human beings. They didn't, they looked like ghosts. They were burned, blackened, and swollen, twice at least bigger than normal body. And the parts of the body missing and bleeding and the skin of flesh hanging from their bones. I did see one woman whose eyes just popped out, out of the socket and just carrying them in their palm. And the people who are injured, stomach cut open with intestine just hanging out. It really was a hell on earth. And those people didn't have physical energy to run and walk normally. They just simply, slowly shuffled from the center part of the city to the safe area, toward the hill. We were told to join that ghostly procession. So, few of us joined this and stepping over the dead bodies and dying bodies, we escaped. All through this time, they were whispering, water please, water please. And when we first Oh, as they walk, they just one by one collapsed and never 
right again. Then when we got to the hillside, I looked down the ground. This was a military training ground about the size of two football fields combined. And literally every inch of that ground was covered by the dead and dying. And there was kind of asking for water. But we had no bucket, no container to carry the water. So we, few girls, went to the nearby stream and washed off the blood and the dirt and so forth. And we tore our blouses and then soaked them in the water and tried to catch the water in it. And we rushed back to the dying people. They are waiting for us with a parched mouth. And they just sucked every possible moisture, like That was the only comfort <laughs> we were able to provide them. That's my city, my beloved city of 360,000. Almost 90% of the population were non-combatant civilians, children, and women, and elderly. Suddenly and totally became heaps of ashes, rebels, skeletons, and blackened corpses. In the center of the city, about seven to eight thousand grade seven and eight students were doing some manual tasks for the military. They were right underneath the explosion. And most of those students died instantly or simply vaporized. One of my good friends was there and she survived long enough to tell us the story of her faithful day. After that, everybody was groaning with the pain and aches and the heat they were feeling. They couldn't see each other because their bodies, their eyes were swollen. But they could recognize each other by their voice so they sat in a circle and they started singing them, including Nira, My God, Today is that the right title? At this and at this time I would like to introduce you something. I asked my alma mater to produce this. Members of the board of directors of the alma mater volunteered to write everyone's name. Those were the grade seven and eight students from my school. And I remember, I can just remember their faces, their voices. You know, when I tell the people, tens of thousands of people just melted died. It doesn't mean very much. So I wanted to create the impression that each one of us two of Chinese characters means the family and two lower Chinese characters means the personal name. And I have 351 from my own school. But I, as I have already said, Seven to eight thousand. Thank you very much. I think that's good enough. Seven to eight thousand. Grade seven and eight students just simply disappeared, melted, vaporized. Um, the total of one hundred forty thousand perished by the end of nineteen forty-five. 
But that was at the end of 1945. Since then, each year, the new names are added at Senator in the Peace Park. People are still dying as a result of the radiation, even today, after 60 years. In the Peace Park in Hiroshima, there is an inscription on the cenotaph, which has been mentioned in the mayor's letter, rest in peace, the mistake will not be repeated. This is the vow of our survivors. Could you drop that podium? And the prayers as well. Yeah. The prayers catch at the bottom. that their death will not be in vain. And I vow that we'll work toward a goal of total elimination of nuclear weapon. We vow no other human beings have to go through that experience. Well, some citizens, some survivors, did not like that wording. Rest in peace. Mistake will not be repeated. The whose mistake? It's too ambiguous. There was quite a bit of commotion about that. But Citizens Committee chose to deal this issue at the higher and philosophical and moral plane. I am glad for that. The wording signifies the universal need for nothing less than a cultural transformation away from our own obsession with violence and war. With this commitment, we survivors have traveled wide on the globe, and I have been living in North America about 40 years, so every chance I have, I have been sharing my experiences with them. Believe me, it's not easy, it's painful. Each time I have to brace myself to remember and share that. But we feel it's our mission, our responsibility, our duty. But continuing that work has brought some tears and pains from time to time. When I first came to uh, college in the United States on scholarship, that was the 1954. If you recall, on the March 1st of 1954, the United States tested the first hydrogen bomb. Huge bomb, nothing like the peanut bomb, crude um, primitive bomb like the one dropped on Hiroshima. And that meant the older inhabitants of Bikini Island had to be evacuated. Island was not habitable. And the fish, which can be caught around there, and Japanese could not eat that. As you know, fish is a staple food for Japanese. So all the Japanese really came to realize, well, this issue is really affecting our day-to-day -day life. But more importantly, so many people in the Pacific Islands suffered from the effect of it, 
and you heard about the jellyfish babies, many pregnant women who were exposed to that brought such babies. But of course, the United States denied the possible danger associated with that. And when I came to University of Toronto to study social work, I found this city very uh, quiet and very British. And um, I found Canadian people were behaving, acting as though nuclear issues was the problem between the United States and Japan, as though they had nothing to do with it. But, but, Mackenzie, Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister then, he was very involved in the Manhattan Project. And our own uranium from Great Bear Lake of Northwest Territory were sent to the state as a supply for the weapon. And also in the diary written by Prime Minister Mackenzie King said it was good those terrible bombs were used on Japanese not on the European of white race. Well, so Canada had a part in developing this horrible weapon which changed everything except our way of thinking as Einstein told us. Well, And August 6th and 9th, 10th, and I found no special gathering like that was organized at that time. I felt a strong feeling of aloneness. People don't understand. And my husband and I paddled the canoe out to the lake, and I grieved. We grieved. Then, coming back to Toronto, we have to have this kind of opportunity. And it was the 30th anniversary, I believe, we started having the observance such as this. Ever since, a group of dedicated people have been organizing this, and I am gratified with the effort. Well, some other painful experience that I had as I tried to spread the message, I'd like to share that with you. When I first came to the college in Virginia, um, this disaster at the beginning was known to at least journalists. So I was asked, my opinion about it, and uh, I gave my own frank opinion. And then I started receiving unsigned hate letters. Go back to Japan where you came from. Who is giving you the scholarship? And even threatened my life. It was a real traumatizing experience for me during the first week in the United States. But here in Canada too, I had a few very unpleasant experiences. Well, smaller problems oh, quite often. But one time, National Gallery of Art in Ottawa wanted to have exhibition of the drawings done by the survivors. I was involved in that. I was asked to make the opening 
remark. At that time, Hong Kong Kensen came in and people learned one was planted in the building. Everybody had to be evacuated. Immediately, I have to fly back to Toronto Pearson Airport because I had to go to Iowa to speak to the group of uh, the ministers via Chicago. Then, the immigration officer opened my purse and found two sets of speech. And one which I just gave in Ottawa, another one which I was to give in Iowa. And he read and said, you know my country is full of business. We don't need any more. And he took my passport away and he disappeared. I said, please bring it back. I can't afford to miss that flight to Chicago. He never came back before the flight took place. I missed it. So when he came back and said, well, here's your passport, it's clear. You can enter my country. I said, may I see the chief official? So I went into his office. He was very apologetic for inconveniencing me. And I asked him, is this because of the Wars on McCarran Act? Some of the American people might understand the meaning. Well, that senator got the Congress to pass that resolution. That was to keep this subversive type out of the country. Because in those days, Anybody who was involved in the peace movement was seen as a communist. Well, and the Reagan's arrival at the White House, he started demonizing the Soviet Union and their people. As we all remember, I just wanted to go through a bit of uh, historical background. Um, and he started openly calling them the evil empire and the godless communist and God is on our side. His thinking were very much affected by Christian rights. And I was horrified when he started talking about limited nuclear weapon was possible and it was winnable. It was survival. It was survivability is possible. And we can be ready for it. All these insane remarks were made by him. I think those things really frightened not only Americans, the people around the world. In Japan, we were furious. And somebody said, Mr. Reagan was a good friend to the peace movement because he scared everybody. They came out of apathy. And look, one million people walked in Manhattan in 1982. And I'm a social worker by profession and uh, many of us are doing the re research on children and the youth. And one striking finding of our study was the strong sense of futurelessness among the youth, which was affecting their day-to-day -day living now. That was a serious psychological damage they were suffering. 
Um, once again, I have been frightened when Mr. Bush arrived at White House. His hawkish and arrogant monopoly and abuse of power scared me. And he said, if you're not with us, you are against us. That very simplistic description of us. And he had no respect for multilateral approach to problem solving. Somehow he felt 9-11 gave him the permission to do whatever he wanted to do on his own. His um, persistent doctrine of preemptive strike, even against non-nuclear states, was really infuriating and terrorized the world. I was saying, what I was complaining about the double standard of U.S. administration in the Mr. Bush's opinion. And my very good friend, the professor at the university here said, no, it's not a double standard. He simply doesn't have standard. Well, we had a few chuckle about that. Well, after all, Nuclear weapons are the cornerstone of the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, over the 60 years, the proliferation of nuclear weapons has taken place in such a frightening way. People ask me about it 60 years ago. They want to hear about what I did, how I felt, but at that time, only one nation had three bombs, one tested in New Mexico, two used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But now we have about 30,000 of them, which are far, far more dangerous. And not only the five permanent members of Security Council of the United Nations, but we have been learning about the new nations like India, Pakistan, and now North Korea. And Israel had had it for a long time. They never openly admitted that. I look year 2000, when the United Nations hosted, hosted the non-proliferation treaty, non uh, treaty review conference, I must say I was very pleased because almost 200 na member nations were able to agree and uh, reach the consensus. And Article 6 of it, I'm not quoting the exact language, but the language which pleased me tremendously is that nuclear weapon state in good faith must make effort to walk toward elimination of nuclear weapon. But look. About three months ago, in May, once again at the United Nations, MPT conference took place. This time, it was a total failure, as the mayor of Hiroshima has said in his meetings. And I understand the United States played a very important role in discouraging other member states to reach the consensus. 
the more proliferation we have, the greater chance of terrorists putting hands on them. I don't have to tell you, you people are very well informed people. But I feel terrorism is committed not only by individuals and the groups of individuals, but by the state as well. What they did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in contrary to international law, I call it uh, terrorism by the state. Well, you heard about the activities of uh, Mayors for Peace. It's wonderful, 1,080 cities, and uh, they met for the sixth time in the city of Hiroshima short while ago. I do know the mayor's feelings were that peace is so important that we cannot leave it to the national and federal government alone. As mayor of each community, they have the responsibility to protect their citizens, especially in nuclear age when you cannot discriminate the combatant and non-combatant. And it was a good program they started. And, okay, I'll end, all right. And uh, just a few days ago, I learned that over two, over half of the cities in Belgium joined this project. And recently, Parliament of Belgium passed the resolution to demand the U.S. to withdraw all the nuclear weapons from their base, from U.S. bases in Belgium. What courage they have. Well, lastly, I want to repeat again, we survivors regard the nuclear weapon as an ultimate evil. It cannot exist with humanity. Because it has a potential to annihilate human species and our wonderful civilization. Therefore, we demand nothing less than, well, we demand not just the arms control, but total elimination of nuclear weapon. In a very brief way, in an organized way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satuko, for giving us the, the uh, encapsulating the situation as it was and as it is, we, we, the struggle ahead of us. And I'd like to thank Satuko also for the, her role in the creation of the Peace Garden in Nathan Phillips Square. She played a leading role in this. And when you get in touch with your councillor and the mayor's office, to encourage them to get really involved in this Mayor for Peace initiative and take leadership. You might also say that you would like the uh, Peace Garden to stay in Nathan Phillips Square. Nathan Phillips Square is going to be redesigned. So let folks know that you want to keep that beautiful garden. Um, thank you.